likely they're going to be able to withstand the challenges and downturns that will invariably come as you're trying to grow and scale a business. It's, you know, it's not, not all like roses and high fives, right? There, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that have to be overcome. And unless you have that passion, it's, it's really going to be, I think, hard for you to stick through those really hard times. And the other part of that is the perseverance, right? It's like, do, do you have the ability to persevere through those challenges and stick it out to, to make your vision a reality? And so when you combine those two, that becomes an extremely powerful and driving force, right? So that, that's something that we look for. And like, I love, I, I love like understanding that drive from entrepreneurs. And, and that really comes through when you talk to, to some of them. Yo, this is Christian D. Evans with Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to our amazing podcast. This is where we reveal the top 1% of business concepts and systems and processes to scale eight and nine figure businesses. We interview top level eight and nine figure CEOs, business owners, and amazing TEDx speakers like David Meltzer. We got Nick Cavuto, Pascal Bachman, and so many others. And if you feel like this resonates with you, please share this with your friend, your family, and make sure you impact them as well because we're trying to spread the message on those that do not know how to scale eight, nine figure businesses and talking higher level business concepts. So guys, remember, enjoy the episode and be uncommon if you can. Cheers. Thank you so much for tuning in to Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. I'm your host, as always, Christian D. Evans. Boy, we have a special guest today. He is the founder and CEO of BioVerge. Now, what the heck is that? Well, it's a venture capital firm exclusively dedicated to investing in early stage, cutting edge healthcare companies. You know how so many times there's, you know, you, you really don't realize the importance of healthcare and these products and services and until all of a sudden you're on that bed and you're like, man, I need something happening. And guess what? They have this technology and he's the one that invests and makes sure that this value prop and this value proposition and this product gets on the market is able to make an impact in your life. Now, before he was doing this, he was the VP of Pres uh, business development at Notable, where he was able to help them raise $40 million in Series B. Also, during the time, he was a member of the executive leadership team and director of business development at the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is CIRM. Now, he was the managing aspect of deploying CRM's $3 billion assets across the organization's discovery, translational, and clinical stage stem cell and regenerative medicine programs. So we're going to be diving into some really, really awesome stuff. And what I want to, want to mention is they have some high quality deal flow. Uh, their BioVerge collaborates with the world's most forward thinking incubators, accelerators, universities, and investors to provide you with access to the most promised early stage healthcare deal flow. Please welcome the co-founder and the CEO, my friend, Neil Littman. How are you doing today, Neil? I'm doing great, Christian. I'm really thrilled to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Man, I'm excited about diving into this because like I mentioned, you are on the cutting edge of stuff. You know, so many people, we always talk about impact investing, right? Uh, whether that's, you know, environmental or sustainability, et cetera. I think this is very impact investing as well because it's literally directing or indirectly helping so many people's lives. But before we dive into this, um, it became an evolution, a little bit of your journey uh, going from, you know, uh, business develop uh, to raising capital for so many different companies to now getting into this healthcare. Help me understand kind of that pivot point, that transition, that evolution from where you were to obviously your passion now, which is BioVerge. Yeah, happy, happy to talk about that. Um, so, and, and Christian, I, you know, I, I really appreciate your intro, you know, because I, I think many of us sort of take health for granted until you're sick. And so, so we have a saying, right, that many of, of you have probably heard, but like health is wealth. Right. And so you, you sort you sort of forget about that until you become sick and you need one of these therapies. But uh, so just just wanted to mention that. But in terms of you know how I got into doing what I'm doing, so I, I've been an investor since high school. I studied molecular biology as an undergraduate. Uh, I worked in a virology lab uh, at the University of Colorado. Um, now everyone knows what virology is. Back then it seemed rather obscure. Um, I have a, a master's degree in biotechnology from Johns Hopkins. Uh, I started my career actually doing healthcare investment banking. So I worked on Wall Street the first six and a half years of, of my career. Um, all of my clients at that time were emerging growth biotech companies. So I got to learn about a lot of different business models, 
uh, due diligence on different types of, of, of science and technologies that were being developed at, at the time. Uh, transitioned from uh, investment banking to CERM, uh, which Christian, you mentioned in your, your intro. So the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, that's a mouthful, so we, we call it CERM for short. Um, so I ran business development there for uh, about six years, and I can only describe CERM as a really unique and wonderful place. And so for those of you who aren't in California, uh, CERM is actually a state agency uh, that was established back in, uh, I think it was 2001, with a ballot initiative in California. So the citizens of California actually voted to establish CERM with $3 billion of funding to invest in uh, stem cell and regenerative medicine therapeutics and enabling technologies. And so uh, what I did at CERM is we provided research funding to a lot of the uh, leading medical research universities throughout California. So Stanford, UCLA, UCSF, uh, you know, all, all those types of universities that have researchers that were doing something involved with stem cells. Uh, a lot of what I did was work with the universities spin, spinning out IP or intellectual property into biotech companies where CERM would provide funding, uh, the venture capital community would provide funding. And the goal was really to translate those therapies from the laboratory bench to the bedside of the patient. So there, there, there's sort of a, a term that we use, which I don't, I don't particularly like, but it's called the valley of death in translational medicine. And so a lot of programs will, will sort of wither on the vine and die because they can't access funding, not necessarily because they're not viable technologies. So some funding was really used to bridge that valley of death to determine whether these therapies could be viable and could actually help patients. Um, and so I'll just, I'll give you one story from my time at CIRM because this really serves as the bridge and my inspiration behind what I'm doing now at Biover. So you can kind of think about this as, as like almost the origin story or like as Simon Sinek says, like my why behind why I'm doing what I'm doing today. So uh, during my time at CIRM, we funded a program at UCLA that was developing a gene therapy treatment for children born with severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, more commonly known as bubble baby disease. Um, it's referred to as SCID for short. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen Seinfeld out there, but Seinfeld did an episode, the, the boy in the bubble, that, that's what this is. So kids born with SCID uh, are born with a defective copy of a specific gene, so they don't have a functioning immune system. So as you can imagine, those children are in and out of the hospital with severe infections and they have a very short life expectancy. Um, and so the, 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 um, the work that we funded at UCLA was coming up with a, a gene therapy, which is a one-time treatment to try to cure these children. So I had the opportunity to meet a little girl by the name of Evie uh, during my time at CIRM who was treated with this gene therapy. She would come to our board meetings with her parents and she would talk about her experience being treated in a CERM funded clinical trial. I met her when she was about six um, and she was cured of her disease, which by the way was previously incurable. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is an incredible story. Like th this is literally like science fiction, but it's science fact and it's happening today. Like, why, why don't more people know that this type of technology exists in the world today? Why can't more people invest in this kind of technology? Um, and just sort of just to, just to put a sort of a, a bow around the story, so the, the IP was spun out of UCLA into a biotech company that went public at a $1.2 billion valuation. So early investors in this technology did, did very well for themselves. So it's this whole idea, it sort of goes back to this idea that you know, Ben Franklin first posited back in like the 18th century, you know, we can all do well by doing good, right? So we're doing good in the world, we're, we're, it's impact investing, right? We're impacting the lives of not just, not just Evie and this little girl, but her family, maybe if she grows up and has children one day, right? And like her grandkids, like, so it, like it has this ripple effect. And by the way, like people financially did well by backing this sort of technology. So it's like, oh my God, this is, this like, it was like a light bulb went out in my head. It's like, can I bring the institutional model of CERM funding to more of the retail sector and enable more investors to invest in this type of incredible technology um, because it is impact investing, but also to generate financial returns. And so that, that's what we're doing at, at BioRoads. And that's, that's really our focus in terms of democratizing access and investing in those types of like really cool technologies, which sound like science fiction, but they're not. They're actually, many of them are here today. 
Well, I appreciate you kind of giving me the, the, the foundation a little bit of that evolution, because one of the things, just like you were mentioning a little bit in regards to the product or even the research, I, I always like to relate to almost like the FDA process for a new drug, right? It, they've put so much time and energy and it takes years upon years. And that FDA drug could be very, very beneficial for you know the, the environment or whatever. However, though, because of the longevity, it takes a lot of time and resources, et cetera. That's the same thing with some of these you know, developing you know, companies. They have these products, they have these things, but it may take a while for it to actually develop, get some traction, et cetera. And that's why I think it's so important to have a, you know, your VC come alongside them and help them. So let's unpack a little bit about the deal flow. Okay, so you said the retail side of things. So it's not too much research focus, but it is focused more on the retail aspect. Help me understand a little bit about your deal flow, maybe some deals that are currently active. Um, and I know you've actually partnered with some really, really cool, um, you know, Ro uh, Rossman Institute, NLC, Scale Health, et cetera. So some very, very well, well-known organizations. So help me understand a little bit about the deal flow and what that looks like. Yeah. So let me, let me sort of start at the 30,000 foot view. So so our goal, again, is, is to connect individual investors. In, in our case, we're, we're really focused on accredited investors to the startups and entrepreneurs who are really at the leading edge of innovation and are working to transform healthcare across a variety of areas. So, you know, Chris, in terms of our deal flow, we are sourcing and investing in companies in various sub-verticals within healthcare. So things like regenerative medicine, so think cell and gene therapies, for example. We also invest in digital health and digital therapeutic opportunities. Um, things like care delivery, things like companies that are what I would call a biotechnology platform or what has become more commonly known as a tech bio company. So those are companies that are using some sort of stack of technology like artificial intelligence or machine learning to try to improve the drug discovery or drug development process. So those are just a few of the different examples that we have. And, and actually, I should, I should back up for one, one moment because digital therapeutics might not be a term that a lot of your listeners are familiar with. So if you think about a traditional therapeutic, it, it's some sort of chemical entity, right? A, a pill or a, an antibody or, or something that you, you take and it, it has some sort of chemical modification to try to treat disease, right? That's, that's sort of traditional medicine. A digital therapeutic is a software application that tries to modify and treat diseases based on behavioral changes and behavioral modifications. So think about changes to lifestyle, diet, exercise, things like that in order to combat disease um, and oftentimes chronic diseases. So things like obesity or diabetes or things of that nature. So there, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of companies that are working on digital therapeutics, which can be used by themselves or can actually be used in conjunction with a traditional therapeutic. So if you, if you sort of think about pairing those two, you might be able to use a digital therapeutic to modify behavior so you can take a lower dose of your medicine, right? So that, that, that's interesting. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, Chris, in, in terms of our deal flow, um, I can't actually talk about any of our current investment opportunities, but let me talk about some of some of our our existing portfolio because um, I think that will give your listeners a good flavor of the types of things that we invest in. So I'll tell you about a company by the name of Volumetric because this is this is a really cool story. So we first invested in Volumetric in July of 2020. Uh, the founder and CEO was a professor of biomedical engineering at Rice University. Uh, we got connected to one of our advisors of, of, at, at Bioverge. Uh, Volumetric is developing technology for 3D bioprinting human tissue and organs, right? I mean, sounds like science fiction, right? But guess what? I mean, we're, we're making progress towards actually being able to do that. So they have already produced the most complex 3D printed object ever, a human lung scaffold, which has already demonstrated gas exchange in animal models. So that, like, that's even that is a huge step forward. So the technology made the cover of Science Magazine back in 2019 when it was first published. Um, you know, sort of fast forward, and the the company Volumetric was acquired um, last year by 3D Systems, which is a publicly traded company in the 3D printing space. 
there, there's a new partnership with another company called United Therapeutics, and they are already working to cellular, cellularize the, the scaffolds with patients' stem cells to create transplantable human lungs. Uh, and importantly, those lungs should not actually require immunosuppression like a lot of organ transplants do because the stem cells that they're using to, to see the lung scaffolds actually come from the patient. So that's not here today, right? So that, that is, that's still pretty far away from actually being available, but that is in, that's in development and that, that, that's pretty cool. Um, so that was, that was, that was a company that we were really excited about. Um, another company that we invested in, it was actually our, our, our first investment that we ever made at, at, um, at Bioverge, uh, Notable Labs, which you mentioned, I actually worked there for, for about two years. Um, so this is, this is a company that is um, working with um, patients with hematological malignancies or, or blood cancer. And so what they are able to do is they have developed a, a high throughput screening platform where they can take a, a blood sample from a patient, they run it through their platform, which has some like AI and stuff sort of in, in the background. And they're able to test different drugs or combinations of drugs, sometimes hundreds of different drugs or combinations of drugs against an individual patient sample to determine how that patient responds to a particular drug or combination of drugs. So if you think about this is this is this is precision medicine, right? And and like the company is really trying to predict the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And so if you think about the power of what this technology can ultimately do, if you can, if you can determine a priori before you give a patient a drug, whether they're likely to respond to that drug or not, I mean, that, that's kind of the holy grail of drug development, right? If you think about enrolling patients in the clinical trial, if you think, if you have a way to determine if they're going to respond to your drug or not, right, you can exclude the non-responders from the clinical trial and include the responders to the clinical trial. And so you're enriching your clinical trial and significantly increasing the probability of success. And by the way, from the patient standpoint, you're saving patients who are unlikely to respond all of the terrible side effects from taking a drug that's not going to be useful to them. So that, like, to me, that's, that's cutting edge. That's super exciting. Um, you know, that that's in development. They're, they're in, they're going to be in phase two clinical trials for a drug that they have in their pipeline. So that, that's really exciting. Um, Christian, I mean, I, I can, I can talk for another hour about this stuff, but let me, let me stop there. I'm happy to talk about some other companies or let, let me know the direction you no, want to go here. No, this is perfect, man. And I love the passion. I love the excitement. I want to stop here for, for one second here and unpack this a little bit. So let's take, you know, notable, uh, for example, and I'm curious when you're looking at a deal, because I would imagine you've seen a lot of deal flow on your desk quite a bit. There's a lot of opportunities out there. How do you, cr um, because you and I understand that a lot of this stuff, it's slightly different than any other industry because sometimes it is very highly regulated for whatever that vehicle may be, okay? So what does that criteria look like? And then as well as how can you help these individuals, not just through capital and, and funneling capital into you know, helping them develop uh, the infrastructure, but also maybe a coming alongside and a, you know, navigating the path for them to make sure that they can get this proof of concept uh, on the marketplace relatively quickly and get through all those, uh, those hurdles that uh, we know it's a very regulated situation. Yeah, so there's there's a lot to unpack there, Christian. So let let's 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 start with uh, sort of the how, how we how we think about making investments in general through uh, through through our platform. Um, so so we invest in in the venture capital asset class, and we're we're democratizing access. So we want you know angel investors and other individuals to invest alongside of us. You know we're also investing off of our balance sheet, right? So we have skin in the game. And so as, as I sort of think about evaluating companies and technologies, there's clearly the, the science really drives everything, right? And so number one, that's why we exclusively focus on healthcare. Healthcare is its own animal. It, it, like, it's a highly regulated environment. Um, there's, just, there's so many nuances that go into developing a product. I, I, I really feel like healthcare deserves and needs its own dedicated ecosystem and you can't, it's, it's really hard just to dabble in healthcare, for example, like you really have to specialize because there's just so many nuances and so many regulations and so many barriers. Um, and for us, like we, we have developed what we call the BioVerge network, which helps us source and diligence opportunities. And so 
that those are those are subject matter experts who maybe have expertise in a certain disease area. So think about a, a clinician that has spent his career in the you know, cardiovascular space or neurodegenerative space or whatever. So we can tap into those people to help us review our deal flow and review the science that these companies are pursuing. You know, we have regulatory folks that we can tap into, right? So there, there's manufacturing is, is a big component of, of a bottleneck for particularly in the regenerative medicine space. So understanding how these technologies are manufactured is, is really important. So that like that, that, that's sort of like table stakes for getting into the game of like healthcare and, and biotech. Uh, uh, just, I think for your, uh, for your audience, I think what would also be helpful is I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give, give you our sense of how we think about investing in this space and like how it fits into like an overall portfolio. So w- when I got into investing, right, I was an angel investor myself. Um, and, and, and really I wanted to diversify my portfolio away from the public markets to an uncorrelated asset class. And that being private market investment opportunities um, and, and venture capital style investments uh, specifically. Uh, and so it was really important for me to gain exposure to what we call positive black swan events and build into my portfolio this idea of positive optionality. So what like what well, what does that mean? So that means there's asymmetric risk versus reward. So it means there's a positive skew toward the reward side of the equation. So Anytime we think about making an investment, we want to be able to ensure that we could potentially make a lot more money than we could lose on that investment, right? So the other thing to think about when you think about investing in the private markets and venture capital or angel investing um, is this idea of frequency versus magnitude, right? So there, there's, you know, th- there's a psychological battle against this idea of loss or version, right? So you know, the folks, Nobel Prize winning behavioral economists like Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, if, if anyone's read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, they talk a lot about this idea of loss aversion, but losses loom two to two and a half times larger than gains, right? So for like, so, so what, what does that mean? So let's say you're like walking down the street and you find a $20 bill, like that's really exciting. Um, but you're going to be much more upset if you lose a $20 bill on the street, right? So that's, that's loss aversion, right? You, you, you value that loss a lot more than you value that like gain. And so in venture investing and angel capital investing, you have to fight that natural tendency that we have because more, this is frequency versus magnitude, right? More of your investments may end up losing, but that's okay as long as the minority end up making you more money than what you're losing in your losers, if that makes sense, right? So it's like the, 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 the common way to think about this is the Babe Ruth effect. Right. So Babe Ruth struck out way more times than most players, but he also holds the home run. Uh, he, he held the home run record like for like 40 years. Right. So as you think about like investing in this asset class, you have to be comfortable with that idea of frequency versus magnitude. And like, you know, the best money managers and like the best poker pra- players like understand this, this sort of concept. Like as long as my winners make up for my losers, then I'm ahead of the game. Right. That's a positive expected value. So I'm going to be ahead of the game. And so like for us, we want to make sure we're getting into the right investments to give ourselves the opportunity to generate these outsized, you know, returns. And so like, it's, it really comes down to the process. Um, So we want to make sure we have a relentless focus on process. We'll make sure we're doing deep diligence, all these opportunities. We want to make sure we're talking to subject matter, subject matter experts, diligencing these opportunities properly and giving ourselves a chance to generate outsized financial returns. Not all of our companies are going to win. Like we know that, but we don't know a priori which is going to have a billion dollar outcome and which isn't, right? Like I wish I had a crystal ball, but I don't. And so you have to construct a portfolio to give yourself a statistical probability of success. So uh, why, why don't I stop there? I, I probably answered your, your specific question and then probably a lot more. So. No, this is perfect. Yeah, and it makes sense because obviously that is the, the VC thesis really is, is finding those kind of uh, attributes. I was also just curious how BioVerge was able to come alongside because you guys have those subject matter experts. You have those connections. You don't only just, you know, str- uh, like I mentioned, funnel, you know, capital in that, in, that, um, uh, in that investment or your portfolio. You're also investing a lot of your time, your resources and your knowledge in that in that experience now what uh, just on a personal note neil you probably have seen some really really awesome you know cutting edge technology cutting edge innovation definitely in this in this industry and it's become even more prevalent uh definitely as you know technology has evolved so i'm just curious what what 
what gets you up now uh, up at night? I mean, what, what, what just moves you? What, what are you most excited about? What are some things that like you've noticed that like, man, I'm, I'm so excited about this, this industry is uh, particularly. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of things. I mean, for, for me, like my, my passion is, is really talking to the brilliant entrepreneurs who are building these companies. Right. And it, it really, you know, our tagline at BioBirds is bringing science fiction to life. And, and I think that's really true. So for me, like, I just, I love learning about these types of technologies that really sound like, you know, it's, it's from like Star Trek, but a lot of the stuff is here today or, or in development. And so what gets me out of bed at, you know, in the morning and what I get excited about is like, okay, who am I talking today? Who am I talking to today? Like what, who's the entrepreneur I'm talking to? What are they building? What is their technology? What can I learn about, right? For me, this is just like, I'm constantly learning about these new opportunities, new business models, new technology. Um, so I, so I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, that, that's incredibly exciting. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about one other company in our portfolio, just by way of, uh, as an example, right? So Aspen Neuroscience, they're working to develop what's called an autologous cell therapy, designed to replace um, some of the neurons that are lost in patients with Parkinson's disease. The, uh, Parkinson's disease patients lose neurons in their brain that produce dopamine. And they thought that those, those loss of what are called dopaminergic neurons lead to Parkinson's disease. So this company Aspen is developing a disease modifying treatment that they're actually using stem cells differentiating them into neurons that can produce dopamine and can inject those into the brain of patients with Parkinson's to try to recover the lost neurons, right? Like really cool. Again, not here today, not available, still in development very early, but like, but like based on research out of Scripps uh, Research Institute in California, it's been like you know 15 years of like research behind all this technology that is now in a biotech company that is being developed and that is going to be moving into into you know clinical trials so like to me that's really cool like like how how, do, how else would i learn about that te technology if i'm not out there talking to the entrepreneurs who are building these types of businesses so to me that that's really interesting um the other the other thing that i get really excited about is just um learning about like the passion of some of the entrepreneurs that we work with, right? Everyone has their own sort of origin story. Um, and, and Christian, you, you, you know, you had asked me, you know, what are some of the things that you look for um, in, in companies? And so like there, there's the science, there's the technical stuff, there's the return and risk profile and all that stuff. But the other huge component is the human element, right? Because we are fundamentally investing in people and particularly at the seed stage, right? We invest like pre-seed, seed, some series A stuff, but like at the very early stage, you're investing in the people, you're investing in the CEO, you're investing in the team. And, and for me to hear the passion, to hear the why, to hear the sort of the origin story about why someone is doing what they're doing. I don't, the how is, is nice, but like, it's really the why that I really get interested in, in learning more about. And, and so then, then what we look for is this notion of, of, of grit, right? Anyone who's read Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, right? Can sort of tell you about some of that stuff, but it, but, but her, her definition of grit is this idea of passion plus perseverance, right? So is the person, the CEO, the founder that we're investing in, are they like, extraordinarily passionate about what they're doing because if they're not it's unlikely they're going to be able to withstand the challenges and downturns that will invariably come as you're trying to grow and scale a business it's you know it's not not all like roses and high fives right there there's a lot of challenges uh, there's there's a lot of things that have to be overcome and unless you have that passion it's, it's really going to be, I think, hard for you to stick through those really hard times. And the other part of that is the perseverance, right? It's like, do, do you have the ability to persevere through those challenges and stick it out just to make your vision a reality? And so when you combine those two, that becomes an extremely powerful and driving force, right? So that, that's something that we look for. And like, I love I, I love like understanding that drive from entrepreneurs and, and that really comes through when you talk to, to some of them. Well, in this space specifically, I've got a lot of friends that are in the VC world and they may focus on like SaaS, for example, SaaS industry. And that is very, you know, um, certain metrics that you can basically allocate, you can identify, you know, and you can also identify the risk tolerance as well. 
and then deploying capital. How am I going to deploy the capital once we raise, you know, $10 million, et cetera. Though in, the, in this industry in particularly, there are so many variables. And, you know, in, in talking about the lab, uh, the testing, uh, they could go really well, or it could take 12 months before it works. You know, sometimes you just have to test ridiculous amount, and you have to funnel a lot of money into de developing the testing. But also, like you mentioned as well, in regards to maybe you're, you're talking about government interference in regards to laws, regulations, et cetera. So there's a lot of variables that go into this a little bit. And I wanted to ask you, Neil, when you're having these conversations and investing in this company, two questions first. One, where, where do you find that most companies have the hardest growth, um, growth focus? And what I mean by that is, what's the hardest hurdle to overcome? Uh, I know it's very contextual, probably depending upon obviously each deal, et cetera, but maybe there's an overarching kind of um, you know, denominator in that regard. And then secondly, as well, where do you like to see when you do give the investment, when you do raise that X amount of capital, where do you like to see that deployed um, in, in more of the, the lab, the testing, the value prop? Because obviously in the SaaS world, it's, hey, marketing and, you know, obviously R&D, et cetera, right? There's certain things that you want to see deployed effectively to get the most return. So what are you looking at when you're, when you're in this industry? Yeah, so a bunch of really good questions there, Christian. Um, so number one, healthcare, biotech uh, is, is a totally different animal than investing in SaaS. You're right. So SaaS is, is very metric dependent, right? There are standardized metrics that a lot of investors look at that can tell the underlying performance characteristics of the business, the health, the growth bubble. That, that doesn't exist in, in biotech. It doesn't exist in, in healthcare for the most part because a lot of the companies, some of the companies we deal with absolutely have marketed products and are, you know, B2B or B2C or whatever. So those are a little different and maybe a little easier to evaluate from a financial standpoint. But a lot of the companies we're investing in, you're not looking at from a financial metrics standpoint. You look at the science and you're looking at the regulatory landscape and you're looking at the next set of killer experiments that they need to do to hit that next value inflection point. So that's where the diligence comes into play. That's where our, our, our network comes into play to be able to accurately accept, to, to assess that next killer experiment. What is the probability of that being successful based on the data that they have today? If they do achieve you know, success in that next experiment, what does that mean in terms of the inflection point? Will they then go up? Will, they, will that then catalyze them to raise a series A round at a higher valuation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we spend a lot of the time. So very different than like the SaaS world. Um, in terms of like challenges um, or, or failure points, um, it, it is very deal dependent. Uh, however, I will say um, there is there's definitely commonality, I think. And, and the, the biggest point of failure that we consistently see is, is not uh, on growth. Uh, it's not even on the science a lot of the time. It's with the team. And so it's often the case where a company dies, not, not because competitors beat it, but because there are self-inflicted wounds. Um, and that can be, then that's often team dynamics. So it's co-founders not getting along for some reason. It's, it's, it's internal fighting. Maybe it's some politics. It's jockeying for this position or that position or, or whatever. So it's, it's oftentimes those internal team dynamics, culture, lack thereof, where I'd say failure happens more often than not. Um, you know, there, there are certainly cases where the science just doesn't work out and, and that's fine. And we want to know that sooner rather than later, right? So you, you, want, to, you want to sort of, you also want to run towards that failure, right? So I've seen companies that maybe don't want to do a certain experiment because if that's not positive, that means the end for the company. And so they sort of dance around that. It was like, well, as an investor, no, you want them to run towards that because you want to fail fast. Um, but it, but it, but it, you know, going back, it's, it's really the team dynamics. And so a lot of the challenges that I see is how do you, how do you recruit a world-class team, right? How do you, and it's, it's not, it's not just about getting, you know, people on the bus. It's about getting the right people on the bus in the right seat, Right. And so I think that's really that's really powerful. It's, you, you can have the right people on your team, but if they're not doing the right thing that they're best at doing, it's not a recipe for success. And I, so I think I think it's really the people challenge is the hardest thing, um, honestly. Um, and so 
how so what you know one of the things that we look for is like how how does how does the founder communicate their vision right because if you think about if you think about the founder like or the ceo or, or, or management team you know whomever right they're not they're not only communicating their vision and their story to investors like like us they have to communicate their story to potential employees to recruit the top talent right and so how are they going to be successful in doing that. And so that like that's a big factor. And so, you know, oftentimes we it's 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 a very rare case where there's a founder and CEO that is skilled in the technical aspects of the business and the science that is also a great salesman and can go out and really sell the vision, right? Those 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 are very different skill sets and they don't often coexist in the same person. When they do, that's a very special company, I think, and a very special entrepreneur, right? And so that's, that's often the type of person we're looking for. However, just because you can't do that doesn't mean your company is not going to be successful and doesn't mean you're not going to be successful. So what you need to do is you need to complement your skill set with someone who is really good at that, that other thing, right? So oftentimes, if there's, a, if there's a really technical founder that maybe isn't as good at communicating the vision or isn't as good as the business, like they need to have a strong business person there. They need to have someone who can complement their skill set, right? If it's if it's a if it's more of like the biz, BD or business person who's the CEO, for example, well, they had better have a really strong C, uh, chief scientific officer who who can really nail the science, right? And so those 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 things don't necessarily have to exist in the same person, but they better exist across the team, right? And so those those are things that we look for. So I don't, another now long that, winded answer to your question. No, no, this is brilliant because I mean, just such such massive amount of. Of detail, and I really appreciate you sharing that because that was something that I was not expecting. I thought it was going to be like, you know, maybe a failed test or whatever, and then as another, you know, four or five million dollars we have to, you know, funnel back into the business and et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but it's more of like you mentioned the team, and I thought that was very interesting. So I appreciate that um, that that awareness, and like you guys are aware that okay, if we know that this is you know very key for the success of this company, then you guys do whatever is possible in your in your capability, your network, and your resources to come along and make sure like you mentioned getting the right people on the right bus and the right positions so that we are going to the zoo and we're rock and rolling so that's good uh this is this is a really good conversation um and i want to ask a little bit on the exit strategy on the back end so naturally you know like you mentioned you guys have some sort of data analysis where hey you know out of x amount of portfolio companies out of X amount of you know companies that we're investing into, we know that we're looking for a few that are going to obviously um, you know win bigger than our losses, right? And with that, there has to be some sort of exit strategy. Some are IPOs, some are uh, you know acquisition. I'd love to get your uh, your um, kind of what you gravitate toward or what you prefer compared to um, you know other exit strategies. Yeah, uh, good, good question. So we currently have 34, well, in total, we have 34 companies in the Bioverse portfolio. We've had four exits out of those 34 companies. So 12% of our companies have exited at this point. And our speed to exit, meaning the time from our first investment to a company exiting is only 2.7 years, which is extremely fast in the private markets. Um all four exits have been via acquisitions. So all, all M&A exits where there's a larger acquirer that has stepped in to buy the company and technology that our portfolio company was developing. So that was the case in, in Volumetric. They were acquired by 3D Systems. Um, I, I don't need to get, get into the others, but it's, so it's, it's the same story. Um, I think we have, out of the 34 companies in our portfolio, I'd say we have at least half a dozen that an IPO would be a viable exit path for that company. And so we, we sort of know that going into the investment, we sort of know, is this company going to potentially have the ability to exit via IPO? And we know that from a, a variety of different ways. Um, I mean, no, number one, it's you know, what, sort of like what vertical are they in? What is, what is, what is their growth prospects look like? How fast are they growing? How big is their market? Who are their competitors? What do the comps look like, right? Are there similar companies that have gone public before them? Are there publicly traded companies out there that you can benchmark them to, right? So there's a lot of those things. Um, the other 
big component, believe it or not, is who the investor base is in these companies. So it's something that a lot of people maybe don't think about, but the investor base in a lot of these companies um, are sort of like a, it's like a pipeline to public market investors. And so if the right private market investors aren't investing, or if the right private market investors or crossover investors aren't on your cap table, it's unlikely that your company is going to be able to get public because those public market investors have really good relationships with certain investors and they trust sort of their deal flow and all that thing. So there's a lot of that that goes on. That's not, not by any stretch of the imagination, always the case, but more often than not, you know, we'll say, okay, we're investing in this biotech company that has this set of, you know, existing institutional investors from the VC world, you know, that those types of investors have a ton of companies that have gone public. So this is, this company has the right profile. It's a biotech company. They're going after a large market. They have a therapeutic, they have a good investor base like that. That company could probably get public at some point if the data is good. We have other companies that are, uh, don't have that same investor base that are maybe going after a different market. Maybe, maybe it's never going to be a five billion or two billion dollar outcome. Maybe the exit potential is like a hundred million dollars or five hundred million dollars or whatever. But you know, if you get in at a low valuation, uh, you know, you can still easily generate a ten x plus return. Um, but we sort of know going in that is that company's probably going to get acquired. And then we, we sort of go through the landscape and we say, okay, well, here's a list of the likely acquirers for this, this company. Here are, here are the comps, you know, here are other acquisitions in the space. Here are the, here are the buyers that have been acquisitive and have bought other companies. Um, but oftentimes we're wrong. I mean, oftentimes a company comes out of left field and buys a company that, that we're investing in. And that, that's happened a few times now. We're like, oh, well, that, that buyer was never on our radar. Um, but the thesis is still the same. It's like, okay, if this technology works, if they can scale to a certain point, if they can generate enough revenue, if they hit some milestone, like this will be an attractive acquisition target. So we, we do sort of think about them in, in different ways. Yeah, and I figured, and that's why it's, I appreciate you kind of helping me understand how you as Neil, uh, CEO uh, and founder of BioVerge, thinks about the exit strategy for each you know, deal flow, because it is very contextual and it's just a matter of what the exit strategy looks like. You mentioned something here, and, and this might be a basic question, but um, I wanna ask, because I'm very familiar with the SaaS world and how they calculate valuation. Um, with this industry, um, how do they calculate the, the valuation? What all goes into it? Uh, because you're talking a lot of, you know, like I mentioned, not only you talk about, you know, IP in the back end, but, you know, you're talking about a lot of different uh, variables in that regard. So what does that look like? Yeah, Christian, good, good question. That's like the billion dollar question. I mean, it's like, you know, could have sort of stick your finger in there and, and sort of triage it. But yeah, you're, you're right. So that there aren't, there aren't like, more oftentimes than not, and this isn't across our portfolio, again, we have revenue generating companies, um, but, you know, for, for biotechs or non-revenue generating companies, it's like you, you can't apply like a revenue multiple, right, to like value companies. So, I mean, the, 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 there's lots of ways to do it. I mean, one, one of the ways that is traditionally done is a risk adjusted net present value calculation, right? So you're doing a discounted cash flow on the company's future products and their market penetration on those products, right? So they have a, a, a drug that affects, you know, X number of patients in the US and in Europe and in the rest of the world. It's gonna be priced at this point and it's gonna be prescribed to X number of patients. That translation to, you know, X hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in revenue on an annual basis, you know, uh, due to an NPV analysis, you know, back to uh, today's dollar value. Right, so it's a time value of money, and then you probability adjust that based on the probability of that product successfully completing a phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trial. Right, kind of like like that's heavy finance, right? <laughs> like so, um, so that like that that's really like one way and probably the best way to do that. And then you do that for like each product in the in the company's like portfolio. Okay, so that, that like that's one way to come up with valuation. The other way to come up with valuation is a comparable company analysis. So you say, okay. This company looks like these other companies that are public companies, and all these companies are valued at whatever, in a range of X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. Say, so, okay, my company looks like these companies, but is maybe a little earlier than these companies because these companies have a phase three drug and my company has a phase one drug. So we say, okay, these companies have a valuation of, I'm just making it up, but a billion dollars. 
there's a lot more risk for my company to get to that point. So I'm going to, I'm going to haircut that, that valuation by 50%. And I'm going to say my companies were $500 million or $200 million or whatever that probability adjustment is based on those comp public comps, because there's a lot of risk to get to that point. So that, that's a very common approach. So you sort of triage it. And then you look at M&A comps, right? So what were, what were similar companies acquired for as well? And so you, you sort of, the best way to do is to triage it, right? So you do like an intrinsic analysis, like what, what is the intrinsic value of this company based on the you know, discounted cash flow of you know, future products? Um, what, are, what are public comps? What are M&A comps? And you sort of come up with like a, a valuation range. Like that's sort of like the, the way to do it. It, it. To be perfectly honest, Christian, like it is, it is way more art than science. It is like, I mean, some of the stuff maybe sounded like kind of heavy finance, but it's, it's, it's not right compared to like investing in, you know, you know, an industrial business or whatever that's throwing off a bunch of free cash flow. Like that stuff's much more standardized and measurable. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it is definitely more art like in, in the healthcare world than, than science. Well, I'm glad I asked that. I'm glad you were able to unpack that a little bit because you're exactly right. In the manufacturing and SaaS, there are certain kind of measurables that are kind of, you know, uh, standards. Uh, that you can kind of run with a little bit. But in regards to this, I, that's what I was wondering, because you're, you're dealing with a lot of variables and what does that look like and what is that value for each kind of phase like you were talking about? So uh, this kind of gives me a little bit of a baseline, but like you mentioned, that's why <laughs> you guys are the experts at doing it. So <laughs> instead of going out there and investing in yourself, so this is awesome. Neil, I really appreciate your time on here, man. Just unpack it, man. I, uh, I just loved our conversation. I love what you do in the industry. I'm so glad that you're on the forefront, coming from your experience to now be on the forefront investing in these cutting edge, uh, cutting edge innovative uh, you know, businesses and really helping them come alongside, not only feed capital into them, but also the resources and those, uh, those experts to really help them take it to the next level and um, uh, you know, make sure that they overcome each hurdle in that growth stage. Uh, and then just what you're doing as well, the exit strategy on the back end. Neil, when some of my audience, they have questions, they want to know more, they want to be a part of what you've got going on, how do they reach out to you, bud? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a website, uh, www.bioverse.com. So you can go go there, you can register, you can sign up for a newsletter, uh, get to know our existing portfolio a little better, come see what we're all about on the website. Uh, absolutely reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, we're we're you know, fairly active on social. You can follow BioVerge on LinkedIn as well. Uh, and feel free to shoot me a LinkedIn message as well. That's probably the easiest way to, to get a hold of me. Um, and I'm always happy to, you know, respond and chat with people and, uh, you know, tell them a little more about what we're doing and, and, and frankly, you know, help you determine if these types of investments are uh, a fit for your portfolio and, and, and your, your specific situation. Now, that said, we're not investment advisors. We don't give investment advice, but, you know, happy to, happy to tell you how we think about the world. Awesome. And guys, those links are in the description below. So make sure you stop what you're doing. He's got a lot of resources. He's got an amazing blog and he's got a lot of access. Um, and, and again, just reaching out, being part of his ecosystem. If you guys have any questions, make sure you connect with him uh, because he's got a lot of, lot of data. Like uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight him today. Uh, so Neil, again, I really appreciate you being on here. I always love to ask my guests before I let you go fully, is there any last words of wisdom they'd like to share with our audience? Oh, last words of wisdom. That's always a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the one that I would posit is, um, you know, especially for the entrepreneurs out there, I mean, I, I think that the, the biggest thing you can do is believe in yourself, right? I mean, you're, you're often, building a company is extraordinarily hard, right? Like, uh, and, you know, if, if you can get another job, I'd say probably stick with something else because building a company is really hard. Um, and I think it, 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 it takes a lot of belief in yourself when there's a lot of naysayers out there to say, no, you can't do that. Oh, that's a dumb idea. Oh, you should do it this way or blah, blah, blah. So I think for, for me, I think, um, and, and it, it, it changes at times, but you, I think you have to have a, a fundamental belief in yourself and what you're building to be able to stick with it. So I, I think, I think there's that. And the other thing I would say is I, I, I often feel like people are afraid to fail in this world. And so people end up sticking in careers that they don't like, they don't love because they're afraid to take that leap because they're afraid they might fail. And I'd say that's not a, that's not a good reason, you know, failure, failure is okay. Um, and it, you know, it's only failure, you know, if you're not learning something from it. Um, and so, you know, don't be afraid, you know, believe in yourself and, and get out there and, you know, give it a shot. 
A lot of amazing words of wisdom there. Guys, that is my friend, the CEO of BioVerge, Neil Littman. Guys, that's Journey with Christian D. Evans Podcast. Until next time, be in common if you can. Yo, this is Christian D. Evans, Journey with Christian D. Evans Podcast. We thank you so much for listening to this amazing episode. If you feel and you know that this was valuable to you, please show some love to our amazing guest by liking this, by commenting on this, by making sure that you do a nice five-star review and just show some love to our guest. That would be really awesome. Also, make sure you share this with a friend, a family, a colleague, someone that you believe would bring value to their life right now. Uh, And guys, we just want to say thank you again for just being part of our community. If you want to have more resources, don't be afraid. Go to christiandevans.com. You can actually schedule a phone call with me or you can send me an email at christian.evans at beuncommonifyoucan.com. That's christian.evans at beuncommonifyoucan.com. Always love to hear some feedback and let me know what is the number one or two things that you are struggling in your business and your life and we'll make sure we have those conversations guys that is journey with christian davis podcast and until next time remember be uncommon if you can cheers